Okay. So we're going over some questions to help you learn study for your uh, life insurance license. What is the primary purpose of a guarantee association in the insurance industry? A guarantee association is there. Right, and the, mar the answers are marked with the right answer here. Whatever, we'll go through and I'll explain them. The guarantee association is there to protect consumers in case an insurer, which is an insurance company, becomes insolvent. So they can't pay their claims. So the guarantee association is there to protect insure in the um, consumers in case an insurance company becomes insolvent. Does anybody remember or want to explain how the guarantee association is formed? And what it is. So it is a state sanctioned organization that protects policy holders. So essentially um, each state or each of the insurance carriers has to like pitch in when they become a, uh, an approved carrier in that state. Each one has to pitch in a little bit so that there's some money in a collect. It's like insurance against being an insurance company. Does that make sense? So picture you got 10 companies in a state and they get approved to sell insurance there. And the state's like, yo, you can sell insurance here, but you got to give us some money. In case and they all pool together. So all 10 put money together because not all 10 are going to flop, right? So say one of them flops and then that money is there to protect one. So it's like a, a safety net against insurance. Any questions about that? And if you have any questions, don't be shy. Raise your hand. This is your this is your license. I'm here to answer questions. All right. Which of the following best describes a moral hazard? The tendency increasing risk due to an individual state of health, a physical condition that increases the likelihood of a peril, an attitude or habit that increases the chance of loss, like reckless driving or a catastrophic event that causes significant losses to an insurer. So a moral hazard is has to do with someone's morals, right? So it's like if you have bad morals, typically people with bad morals have bad habits. Does that make sense? So bad morals, bad habits, meaning because of your, what the heck? Because of your morals, we're not going to accept you because people with bad morals typically don't live a long time. Make sense? Okay. So it could be like, oh, this person, you know, has gotten caught for, so yeah, like reckless driving. Like this person has, has been caught multiple times for reckless driving. Like clearly they don't, they're just completely negligent of risk. You know, it's like this person got in a motorcycle accident and still rides motorcycles. Probably not going to live, too, you know, well, might live a long time, but, you know, insurance company is not going to bet on that. In the contents of risk treatment, what does risk retention mean? Accepting the risk and confronting it when it occurs. What distinguishes a mutual company from a stock company in the insurance industry? So it says mutual companies are owned by their policyholders in dividends when declared are paid to them. So a mutual company is owned by a policyholder. A stock company is owned by a stockholder. Okay. So picture two different companies. One, both companies issue policies to people. So both companies have policyholders. One of the companies, the stock company, is traded on Wall Street. So there are shares. So you could go buy a piece of that company on Wall Street. The other company is not. So all the money that it gets to raise funds come from its policyholders, right? Wall Street, if a company is traded on Wall Street, they need to make decisions that are based on satisfying stockholders, which is quarterly. You know how companies post their quarterly earnings? So com companies re re report quarterly their earnings. If their earnings are low, their stock drops and people sell, and then they have less money, right? If their earnings are great, the stock increases and people want to keep it or the people see it trending up, so they'll want to buy something that's trending up. If they have a profit, they pay their 
stockholders part of that profit because the stockholders own a piece of that company. Does that make sense? Mutual companies, the policyholders own the, have ownership in the company. So the, those company profits go back to the policyholders. Mutual companies issue participating policies, which means the companies participate in receiving company dividends. Stock companies issue non-participating policies for the most part, which means that the stock, the policyholders do not participate in the receiving of dividends. Dividends are not guaranteed, although most of these companies that issue them, they, this the all these stats talk, talk they're pretty hardcore about how dividends are not guaranteed. But most of the big companies have been paying dividends every year for like 175 years. So it's like they're not guaranteed, but you know. Pretty good chance you're gonna keep get you're gonna get your dividends. Um, so participating policies are more expensive typically than non-participating policies. They typically charge you more money, okay, to to share and that's and all that stuff because they're also not getting money from Wall Street. But if you have a policy that participates in dividends the cash value is going to grow a lot faster and those dividends can be used to buy additional insurance. So the cash value and, and face and face amount, the death benefit of those policies will actually increase over time. So participating whole life policy, the death benefit and cash value typically in, both increase in a non-participating policy. The cash value does increase not nearly as fast as in participating policies and the death benefit does not increase in, in non-participating policies. So stock companies, non-participating, don't pay dividends to policy owners. Death benefit is constant. Cash value grows slower. Participating means the, po the policies participate in company dividends. More money is put back into the policy and it grows faster and your face amount and your, or your death benefit and your cash value will both grow. Okay, cool. That's only with whole life policies. You can't have like a participating term policy because there's no cash value component. All right. What is a key feature of a risk to be considered insurable? So the risk must be predictable in terms of occurrence and severity. So risk has to be something that can be measurable. Okay. So it's like cancer. If someone gets throat cancer. That's how one out of however, how many people get throat cancer how does the average what's the average person live who has throat cancer like you know things like that like this person's mom and dad ha did not have throat cancer but their grandfather did what's the odds of this person getting right so there's like these risks that have to be measurable what is the primary characteristic of a mutual insurance company just went over this it's policyholders receive may receive dividends and it's owned by policyholders the Fair Credit Reporting Act requires that individuals be informed if they're being investigated by an inspection company. So it's like Fair Credit Reporting Act. It's just saying, hey, if someone's checking your credit, then you have the right to know. That makes sense? Someone just can't like look you up because they feel like it without you knowing. It's protecting your private information. You can say, I don't want you checking it. And the insurance company is going to say, great, well, I don't want to insure you. <laughs> so you can refuse it, but they're, they're not going to, they're not going to insure you. You know, they, they check like cr typically criminal history. Some insurance companies will want to see your credit history because they say people with good credit live, be live longer than people with bad credit, which is pretty crazy, but that's what life insurance companies say. So if you want to live a long time, work on that credit guys. I'll help you out. Mine used to be 420, ironically, right? ex-drug addict with a 420 credit score. Imagine that. It's pretty, when I saw that ran, I was like, man, that's a, it's a, it's a unique number, but now it's pretty good. So I can teach you guys how to do it. I used to do finance. Uh, what is, what type of insurance is term life insurance? It's temporary protection in expiring without value if the insured outlives the term. So term terminates. You have term insurance for a specific period of time. Uh, we are not Ashley Murray. We are not uh, um, authorized to sell life insurance in Hawaii. Hawaii. It just doesn't make sense time-wise for us to call in that time zone because it's like so you know so far, it would take. It just doesn't. It just doesn't make sense. And, and I think it's like super expensive for a company to get authorized there. Um, I live in Puerto Rico, and it's like the most expensive. It's super, it's like a thousand bucks to get an insurance license in Puerto Rico, which is pretty crazy. 
Um, temporary, so it's temporary protection expiring without value. So term is typically issued to cover someone's human life value or a debt, okay? Or for a business, for a business uh, protection. So like if you have a mortgage, right, you might get a term policy in case you die before your mortgage is paid. That way the, your family can pay off the house, okay? Hopefully it's used for that. If you can also have terms, say someone has a baby and they're like, okay, well, I want, I make a hundred thousand a year. I want to have my kid. I want to have at least a hundred thousand dollars replaced for at least 20 years. So it'd be like $2 million. If you factor in consumer pricing index, it'd probably be around $3 million, meaning inflation. So a $3 million life insurance policy for someone who makes a hundred thousand dollars a year would make sure that their income would be continued on for 30 years. I mean, 20 years if they passed. Does that make sense, guys? So that's something I could cover too. This is if someone has a kid, a term policy is kind of a, a sort of a no-brainer. They're usually really cheap. So you get, if you get approved for a term, 99.9% .9 chance you outlive it. Hopefully it's the worst investment of your life because <laughs> that means you lived. Okay? You lived a long time. We have clients ask us about that. Well, what if I pay in this much and I live longer than if I pay for X amount of years, I pay more than I get back. I'm like, yeah, I hope that happens because it means you lived a long time. If it's a gr if it's the best return on the investment ever, it means you died very soon after getting it. Which statement best describes risk pooling? So risk pooling is when you combine a large number of similar risks to, pre to predict losses accurately. So risk pooling. So imagine a swimming pool. And there's a bunch of people swimming in it, and each of them are at risk, right? We're like, hey, we're going to put all these risky people in one pool, keep them kind of contained, right? Okay, we know that if we put a bunch of people in a pool with a swim-up bar, maybe a couple of them will end up throwing up by the end of the night. You know, on average, out of every 50, two do, all right? Okay, under the McCarrison-Ferguson Act, what is the primary role of the state in the insurance industry? So the state is, their primary role is to provide consumer protection and ensure that fair trade practices at the state level. So the McCarrison-Ferguson Act, what it did is it gave rights to the states for insurance. It's annoying for us because we got to figure out how all 40 something states we hire in issue their insurance licenses, where you got to go for your fingerprints, what tests you got to take, what code you need. It's a lot, but it's good for the federal government because they don't have to worry about it. And it's good for us because we're not regulated by any federal agency or anything. So life insurance is great because even the state government, they're, they're kind of like hands off. They're like, hey, do what you want as long as it's ethical. Health insurance, it's like, you know, look at what happened in 2008, right? With Obamacare, the, um, that, that, I forget what the whole name of the act is, right? Whole industry was changed, was turned on its head overnight. Could happen again. They could pass a law and say, you know what? Commissions aren't allowed on health insurance plans anymore if they're issued through the government. And then boom, everyone's out of a job. For us, we're pretty secure. They don't really care. We actually save the state money. Anybody want to take a guess on how life insurance saves, saves the state money? They don't have to pay to bury people. That's one. They wouldn't, they probably wouldn't anyway, but that is one if the state wanted to be nice. So imagine husband and wife, um, imagine that you got a uh, wife's crushing it. You got a stay at home dad. And um, one day mom's on her way home from work, gets hit in a car by a car. And now her income's cut up. She, she dies, income's cut off. Dad doesn't have a job. He's got all this house. And then he's got medical conditions too. He loses her insurance, her health insurance. Now he's on Medicaid, and the state has to pay all his medical bills. And then the kid needs to apart now he and he has to apply for government aid for the kid to keep going to the school and stay in the same neighborhood. Maybe he has to apply for Section Eight housing. So now the government's gonna pay for some of his rent. So when like that's why life insurance benefits aren't taxed because the state, although they would make money. And the government, the feds would make money and the state would make money off the tax on a life insurance policy. The amount of money that it saves them from not having to pay people's like welfare and stuff. If from those people who would be, you know, left dependent when the dependents are left without money, it's, it saves them more. So that's a big reason why life insurance death benefits aren't taxed. 
What does a buyer's guide in insurance typically provide? It just has information about various types of insurance products and their features. So a buyer's guide is something that's issued with a lot of life insurance policies in many states. It's just a guide that says, hey, this is the type of insurance so that people have like some sort of basic understanding of life insurance because most people don't know as much about life insurance as they do other types of insurance, right? So liquidity, so it asks in insurance terminology, what is liquidity? Liquidity means how much money do you have fluid, liquid, meaning how much money can you just flow to one direction? So that's like what liquidity means, all right? It's an insurance company's ability to make unpredictable payouts to policy owners. So how liquid, if someone like comes to you for an investment, so you had a bunch of money, they say, how liquid are you? Meaning like, how much money do you have in your checking and savings accounts right now that you can just transfer if you had to? All right. Um, any questions so far about any of this stuff or anything else I've covered or anything at all? Okay. Well, if you do, you can come off mute and speak up. It's fine. Uh, we did one over this. What is the principle of indemnity? Indemnity is restoring the insured to the same financial condition as before a loss. Okay. So indemnity means you lose. The, it's just and when the it's where the insurance restores you to exactly where you were before the loss happened. Okay. So it's like uh. In the context of insurance, what does a captive insurer refer to? It's an insurance company established by a parent company to insure its own loss exposure. Right. So it's like an insurance company that sells its own policies, pretty much. What is an advantage premium assessment mutual? An advanced premium assessment mutual. It's a mutual insurer that charges premiums at the beginning of the policy period. We went over the buyer's guide. Which of the following best describes reinsurance? So reinsurance is insurance purchased by an insurance company from another insurance company to limit loss exposure. So it says like, hey, uh, can you insure me on my risk? So it's like one insurance company, say they insure 100,000 people. And they go to another company and they say, hey, can you help share this risk with me? And uh, if there are a lot of claims, then... You're you're partly responsible for pay, for these claims, so it's like or for, for for providing me with money to help against my risk. So it's like an insurance company getting insurance on the insurance policy it issues. Anybody confused by that? Okay. Can you explain that again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So reinsurance is an insurance company issues a bunch of policies. And then if that they're taking a risk, right? So all those people could technically die overnight. So the insurance company is saying, hey, we don't want to take that whole risk. We don't want to take the risk of that happening. So is, will any of these other companies share the risk with us? So essentially they buy insurance for their company. to They, they, they protect themselves against overexposure to loss. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like a safety net, yeah. What characterizes the mutual company? We went over this. Lloyd's of London. What does Lloyd's of London represent? It's an association of members underwriting insurance-like coverage. So it's like um, Adele used Lloyd's of London to cover her voice, right? I think J-Lo used Lloyd's of London to cover her butt, like legit, 100%. I, I, I'm like pretty sure of that. So people get insurance on like random things, right? Like Adele, she loses her voice. Surgeons will get use Lloyd's of London for their hands, right? So if they're like, well, if I lose, you know, if I lose, if I get par paralysis in my hand, then I can't work. Adele, she loses her voice. She's, you know, she's not screwed, but she can't keep singing. Probably make her, probably make her tracks more valuable, to be honest. She'd probably make more money. In insurance, what does risk retention imply? Oh, that's also too. So you guys, um, who was it? Who is that? Who's that country singer? Uh, Morgan Walmart. No, I'm just kidding. Morgan Wallen. So he, he, so he, he had something where his voice was insured and he, um, 
if he starts to lose his voice from having too many concerts, they they make it. They're like, if you don't stop, we're not going to cover it. Right. So they they have to like have a deal where like, yo, if you're singing a lot though, and your voice is starting to, you can't just like like keep forcing it out. You got to like be you know precaution. So it's kind of cool. They ensure like random stuff. Risk retention. We just went over this. Policy summary is a summary of the terms, conditions, and coverage of an insurance policy. So a policy summary comes with the policy once it's issued. Um, I don't have these these practice questions available uh, publicly. These you just have to watch this video. I'm going to post it on my YouTube channel, which I hope everybody has subscribed to. Okay, so now we're going to go over chapter two. What constitutes consideration? So consideration is the insured's premium payments and the insurer's promise to pay benefits. So it's the premium payments and the application. So it's consider consideration is hey what are, what is each party offering the ins the person with the who's getting the insurance is offering their premium plus the information on the application. The insurance company is offering the promise to pay the claim. Does that make sense? It's like what's each what's each company bring into the table. A contract of adhesion is a contract that must be accepted as is. So it's like there's no negotiation. It's like take it or leave it, contract of adhesion. I had a guy the other day. He's like, I think most people know insurance is like that, right? You can't like negotiate with Geico for like a cheaper rate. It's like, this is what it is. Okay. So the guy was like, well, he's I could get him like 15000 for 200 bucks a month. And he was like, He's like, I'll do twenty thousand for two hundred bucks a month. I was like, it doesn't work like that, bro. I'm like, that's this is it. Find the best rate. He's like, well, you let the company know that's my final offer. I was like, dude, not how. I'm like, they literally don't care. <laughs> they make like two hundred million dollars a year. You're two thousand dollars a year. It they they do not care. So take it's up to you. Well, just go see what they can do. I'm like, all right, bro, I'll call them. <laughs> see what the, I didn't call them. I can't call them. That's just their rate. And you can't do that. That's illegal anyway. That's discrimination. So if you give someone a lower rate just because they ask for it, hook them, hook me up, and then everybody else has to get the same rate. It's it's illegal. It's an unfair trade practice. Which type of contract is characterized by an unequal exchange between the insured and the insurer? An aleatory, aleatory. So unequal exchange. The insurance company is saying, "Hey, you give me for that guy. You give me two hundred bucks." I'll pay 15000 if you die. So it's an unequal exchange. And then same thing here. So what is an aleatory contract? A contract dependent on an uncertain event with unequal exchanges. When does insurable interest need to exist in a life insurance policy? At the time of the application and inception. So insurable interest needs to exist when the policy is approved or applied for. Okay, it doesn't need to exist later. Insurable interest just means that the person, um, like like someone, there will be a loss sustained by someone, right? To like to the beneficiary. So like, you know, I can't go to get a life insurance policy on like Jeff Bezos because if he dies, it doesn't really affect my life. I don't lose anything. Principle of utmost good faith. Is, it's kind of just how it sounds. Uh, both parties must fully disclose all material facts and avoid misrepresentation. So it's just saying, hey, we're assuming that both that both people are telling the truth and being as honest as possible. Right. Uh, a warranty. What is the legal significance of warranties? Warranties are statements guaranteed to, be, guaranteed to be true and can void the contract if found false. So it's like, I guarantee you that I am Justin Vomigan. And if, like, I wasn't, then that would void the contract. Does that make sense? All right. Representation is something that's believed to be tr true to the best of my knowledge and belief. So do you have cancer? No. Have you ever? No. To the best of my knowledge and belief, I do not and have never had cancer. Right? It's not something that you know. Like, because everybody here could have, even if you don't think you had, you could have and then maybe like went away. Right? We We could. So it's like, you know, best of your knowledge and belief is a representation. Warranty is something guaranteed to be true. Subrogation. Subrogation in insurance is when they pursue a third party responsible for a loss. So it's like, say someone got murdered, right? 
So someone had a bunch of life insurance on them and then random person just comes and kills them. And then the insurance company has to pay the claim out. They could go after the person who murdered them because they're like, yo, if you didn't, if you weren't such an idiot and killed this person, then we wouldn't have had to pay the claim. Okay. Makes sense. All right. What is a voidable contract? It's a, con a valid contract that may be annulled by one party. So a voidable contract is one that can be voided. Uh, what role does a broker play in the sale of insurance? So the, a broker represents multiple insurers under separate agreements. So a broker has contracts with multiple different insurance companies, right? Uh, legal purpose is essential out of these for legality of an insurance contract. Legal purpose. Legal purpose is typically insurable interest. It has to do with insurable interest, right? What does consideration in an insurance company contract specifically refer to? So it's the premiums and the promised benefits. Consideration, right? What type of contract is an insurance policy where the insured must accept all the terms? Just went over that contract of adhesion. Okay. All right. So um, what I'm going to go over is the best tips that I could give you guys for passing this exam the first try. Go through all the practice exams. Okay. Go through all the study guides. Go. You want to you wanna really make sure you can define all the key terms and keywords. Like when we're going here, contract of adhesion, premium, consideration, aleatory, unilateral, McCarran-Ferguson Act. Like you just want to go through – this is just a big vocabulary test. That's all it is. So just go through. If you don't know what the word is and the definition is, just repeat it back to yourself a ton of times. Just read it and repeat it back to yourself a ton of times. Okay? So just – like whatever whatever the word is, the definition, just, just write out the definition and say it back to yourself and just keep repeating it, repeating it, repeating it until you get it down. 90% of this stuff, you guys, you're not going to use once you get your license. 99% of it. Like literally no clients care about any of this. They do not care that it's in the contract of adhesion except for like that one dude. And I've been doing this for six years. Um, They don't care that it's unilateral. Like no one knows what that is. Right. No one knows what an aleatory legal purpose consider the no one no one's gonna be like, here's my consideration for this policy. Where can I mail my consideration? Right. They're like, where do I pay my bill? <laughs> right? So we work with fixed income seniors. So typically people sixty you know, sixty or older, sixty five or older. That's our main source. Um there are plenty of fixed income seniors who got their stuff together. In general, though, we work with the most irresponsible group of Americans that exists. All right. You see these people nowhere except Walmart. That's it. They don't go anywhere else. Walmart and home. All right. So you, you ever go to Walmart and you're like, man, where do these people come from? You ever, you ever like get that when you go through Walmart? These are those people. Okay. <laughs> Just by the so, appearance alone. Yeah. Like, man, where do they come from? That These are those people. Okay. So, and I love Walmart. I'm just saying the next, next time you go to Walmart, you're going to be looking around, but like we typically, we, you know, there, there's a reason why there's 70 something that don't have life insurance. Right. Um, so really what I'm saying is like, we're not trying to wow anybody with our knowledge about, of insurance, like to sell insurance. You don't need to know any of this stuff. All you got to do is be someone that's cool to talk to. You make them laugh. If you can make someone laugh, like it's way easier. Um, I'm going to put that link in here. Like, think about it. Like most people, right. When, when they're asked what, um, like their ideal trait is and like someone that they want to, uh, talk to, right. Or be with as a, uh, as a partner is, is, um, uh, can, does it make me laugh or can I laugh at this person? So, clients it's like the same thing can that can if you can make them laugh and like you that's goes way above and beyond everything else because most of you most of these people know that they need insurance right like they they know um okay so here's the link 
So for the test to actually get the insurance agent license, is most of these questions going to be on those tests? Or is this just kind of like the practice right now? Well, I don't have the real questions on those tests. But if you know what the words are, if you know the definitions, like there's only so many ways they can ask what a contract of adhesion is. You know what I'm saying? There's only so many ways they can ask what a the McCarran Ferguson Act is. There's only so so if you know all those definitions, it doesn't matter what question they ask. It doesn't matter if the questions are different. You know, it wouldn't really be legit. Think about it. From the state's perspective, would, would it be legit if they gave us all the questions on the test for everybody to study? No. Like I had someone last week be like, oh, this is open note test, right? I'm like, no, <laughs> it's not open. No, you can't, you know, bring the book in. Like the state wants, just wants to know, like all, most of the test guys are just the most of it's like the legal side. That's all the the government, the main things the gov state governments want you to know is like, what's twisting, right? What's rebating? What's coercion? So these are things you're going to learn in the legal sections, but rebating is if you're like, if if your client's like, oh, I don't I don't have my hundred dollar premium, and you're like, huh, look at those cookies you just baked over there. What if I gave you a hundred bucks for those cookies? You think you could pay your premium? So that's like rebating, right? Um, twisting is when you like lie about a policy to like get them to buy your policy over someone else's. Um, coercion is if you're like Miss Betty, if you don't buy this policy. I'm going to break your mailbox, right? Something like that. So they, they want you to know like when to be, what's being a bad agent, what's being a good agent. And they want you to know about the insurance policy. So if you guys just go through and know those definitions, I know it's a lot of definitions and stuff, but it's not like, there's no, it's not really anything. It's not really a ton of stuff that's conceptual. Once you know the, you know, they're, they're not going to be like, Hey, this client has this and this, or, you know, this person has this much and like, what type of policy would you recommend to them? It's, it's very rarely like that, maybe with annuities, cause there's suitability, but they mainly want you to know, like the basic features and stuff of the policies and the, and the laws. So if it's you just kind of like the common friends questions with the uh, insurance. Yeah. The questions are going to be like, the questions would be similar to in the course. They should be, but like I said, there's only so many ways that you can ask what that is, right? You know what I mean, Janine? So like, if it's like, um, uh, 